When I was growing up, I was a very shy, quiet child, and uh, I was drawing a lot when I was a kid, but um, it wasn't until my mother gave me a book of cartoons by James Thurber that I began to trace his cartoons, and it made her smile, and I was, I was hooked from that moment on that I could make her happy. In high school, I did the same thing, drawing all the time. It was a way to be by myself without, without um, seeming odd. I became the artist in school, you know, drawing my friends, drawing people, um, and that's, that's where my love of cartooning started. That was a time period in the 70s, late 60s in, into the 70s when the country was in a lot of turmoil. And I was a big fan of political cartoons. Doonesbury was, Gary Trudeau was starting up, uh, her block was a big influence, so I thought, I'm not the kind of person that's going to go on a picket line or, or protest loudly. I'm just going to draw, and that's, maybe that's how I can help, by drawing political cartoons. But I didn't, I didn't know how that could be uh, done. I didn't, think, I didn't think I had the strong enough opinions to be a political cartoonist that, you, that I thought you needed. I was, a, I was an okay student, not a fantastic student, but I was always drawing. I decided to go to a college out in Indiana called Earlham College, in part because it had a small art department. It had a ceramics department, which I loved doing ceramics. Uh, it had a great biology department, which is my other interest as well, and a lot of outdoor programs, um, and also a lot of off-campus programs, which in the 70s was not as common as it is now. The first program that I went on that was really influential in my, in my career, in my life, was a fine arts program in New York City. Where you went to New York, if you got into the program, you'd, you'd live in New York with, with other students and study with an artist or an institution that was in the program. A lot of the students studied with, with well-known artists like Philip Perlstein or Richard Haas was, a, was somebody I was considering. I also looked at the Natural History Museum, the American Museum of Natural History, um, as a place to intern and, and I finally chose to work there for a semester and it was such a wonderful place, it still is very welcoming art department. Uh, some of the people in the art department were the, the men, they were all men actually, who painted those backdrops, those amazing backdrops. And, um, and then another program I did at Earlham, which was also influential, was a trip to Eastern Europe and, uh, and the USSR, which back in 1976 was, was rare for um, Americans to travel there. I um, studied what art I could see there. I studied uh, graphic art. I loved the posters, particularly in Poland. And I did some drawings for my final project for that of my impressions of that region. So I think that was a, a, it was a continuation of my drawing what I was seeing, drawing what I was experiencing, drawing cultures that I, as, I, as I saw them, which is what I still do today. So while I was working at the museum, I was, I was drawing um, nights and weekends, trying to, trying to perfect what a cartoon is. And I was submitting every week to The New Yorker. I took a class at Parsons School of Design um, in cartooning with Mort Gerberg, which he was a cartoonist at The New Yorker, and I <clears throat> learned how, I was already drawing, but I learned how to better uh, craft what is a New Yorker cartoon, how the caption goes with the drawing, that kind of thing, uh, how, to, how to find what you're thinking about. It just, it just was a discipline that was helpful. So I, every week I would uh, gather together five, ten of my drawings and take them down to the New Yorker and drop them off. You go to the 20th floor and drop them off in a window and um, this glass window and a woman sitting at a desk behind the window and she'd take your envelope and then hand you back your envelope from the week, previous week, your rejects. And I did that for several years and finally, um, finally sold one. When I uh, first sold my first cartoon, I handed my envelope to the woman and she said, she paused and she said, oh, Mr. Lorenz wants to see you. And I'm, my heart stopped, like, what? And I thought maybe I'd done something wrong, but I don't know. So she buzzed me in, and this is the old offices. They're very, very, they were very um, nondescript, very blah, very bland, but I was in, it was so exciting because I was in the inner sanctum of the New Yorker. I'd gotten past the, the door. And uh, I stopped in the ladies' room, which is right around the corner, and, and gathered myself and, and uh, took a deep breath. I was really, really, really nervous. 
And uh, they went down to, to Lee Loren's office, and he, he was in his office, great office. He said, where were you? So he knew I was there, but I'd taken my time to get there. And anyway, so it was, it was awkward. But um, he told me I want to buy this, and, and I said, great. And, and I went home, and, and then during the week, I think I got up the gumption to call him, and I said, well, what style, what style do I draw this in? This is the first one. And he said, draw it in your style. And I'm like, my, I have a style? So it was thrilling. What was interesting about the, that time period was I sold, the first cartoon I sold to The New Yorker was a captionless one. A lot of my early cartoons were captionless because I was not a big reader and I just, I liked visual humor. I liked not using words. And that's a typical cartoon, New Yorker cartoon joke is that you take what you know and you twist it or you take what you know and put a, put a little unexpected element to it. That's what creates humor. That was the first one they bought, and, but it's not the first one they ran. So the, the next one that I sold was a sequential drawing of a man walking down the street. He passes a dog that's, that's sitting there and he, and he stops and thinks to himself, maybe I don't pet dogs enough. And he turns back around and he pets the dog and then he walks on. So it's a four, four panel drawing. And when I submitted the sketch, Lee Lorenz, who was the art editor at the time, said, well, you have the dog attached to a, a, a post in the ground you really should probably have the dog attached to something else, like a, like a um, parking meter. And so I went out and I said, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Why didn't I think of that? And I went out um, and for the next week I sketched parking meters <laughs> to try to get it right. The New Yorker never, never tells its cartoonists what to draw. Um, it's all up on our, on our shoulders to, to come up with the ideas, to come up with the the, the point of view. And the best, in my mind, the best New Yorker cartoons over, over a century now, almost a century, are the ones that come from a particular voice. So the ones that, the cartoonists that we remember, that we know really well, are, tend to be cartoonists who had that voice, who had a way of looking at the world that everybody recognizes. Like, you know, the William Stiggs of the world, the Roz Chass, the Charles Adams. I was a feminist from the beginning, um, but I didn't think I was a feminist cartoonist. I didn't. I just wanted to be a cartoonist, and didn't occur to me that that there were men and women cartoonists. I just it didn't wasn't on my radar. But as I became more in that world, selling to the New Yorker, I began to realize that that there were not many of us and women drawing cartoons. But I think I've asked Lee Lorenz since about this. Were you looking for women cartoonists? Because he brought in Nurit, Roz, and myself. And uh, he said, no, he was just looking for new ways or different ways to express humor. And I think my theory is uh, he wasn't looking for women. He was just looking for new approaches. And if you, if you open up the standard for what's considered good, look for different ways to approach something, you're going to find more diversity. My cartoons are not laugh out loud funny necessarily. So maybe some of them are, I hope, but they're more uh, observations of life. They're more, the, the technical term people use in our business is slice of life cartoon. They're observations about what's going on, or who's, things people said to each other, and um, they can be humorous. Drawing for The New Yorker in the 80s and 90s, I was doing cartoons that were um, about life in New York, about some politics. I would do some political cartoons for The New Yorker about elections and uh, cultural trends and things like that. After 9-11, I felt like I couldn't be a cartoonist anymore. I was not sure why I was doing it. And that sort of, I did sell one about the attack to The New Yorker and they bought it and ran it. But I also vowed that I would try to do more political cartoons if I could. Well, women's rights has always been uh, my main focus politically. And I'm, I'm, my radar is always up for that. It's interesting to find, to try to find a niche with a political cartoon viewpoint um, that might resonate with people. I, I do have people that follow me and like what I'm doing, but um, because of the internet, it's often hard to find a place because everybody's yelling. So I think if you pull back into your quieter with your work, sometimes um, it resonates with the a certain population, they'll they'll stop and listen to what you're doing. I was aware, as I've as I've mentioned, that that there were fewer women cartoonists um, in any in any of the different branches of cartooning. 
There just have not been as many women. And that prompted me to look at The New Yorker, my home, and um, began to look at the history of the women who drew for The New Yorker and um, spent a whole year in the archives at the New York Public Library. It was just a wonderful year. They just wanted the best artists of the time in New York to be cartoonists, the best cartoonists. And, and they, didn't, they didn't pay attention to gender. So um, there, were, there were a good number of women cartoonists, and this was in the 20s. So, and that was also a time of more women coming out and, and pursuing artistic professions. And there was a, there was a boom of uh, comic art at the time as well. So, um, so I wrote a book called Funny Ladies about the history of the women cartoonists from 1925 to 2000. And I'm currently working on a new edition. So, because there's a lot more women drawing now for The New Yorker than ever before. It's great. Things have opened up. And from there, I just wrote essays. I wrote for Forbes uh, online. Uh, about about politics, about women's rights, and now I write for Medium. Um, and I began to realize a, a nice combination for me is is having a drawing and then writing about it a little bit as well. So the combination of, of, of a drawing and, and a fleshing out of, of the idea in words was something that I enjoyed doing. With Funny Ladies, I created my own book tour, and I went around and I, and I had never done any public speaking before, but the fact that I was talking about these women made it so much easier. Like if you're learning to be a public um, speaker, it's so much easier to talk about other people and people you're passionate about, their work, their, their struggles. And so I began speaking about that and it led to um, more speaking and, and to doing a TED talk. I was doing a lot of introspection at the time about my career as a, as a cartoonist and a woman and what that was all about. And that's what the TED Talk is about. It's like finding my voice and learning how humor has helped me find my voice and how I think humor can help women in general break, break the rules down. Back in 2005, there was an incident that happened globally. In Denmark, an editor uh, commissioned a group of artists, uh, some, some, of them, some people he asked and chose not to do it, to draw Mohammed um, and do cartoons about him or just draw him, which um, is in some, in some facets of, of the Muslim religion is, is forbidden. So these cartoons were drawn and they, they didn't, nothing happened with them at first, but after a while, and this is the beginning of the internet, the cartoons were, were used by extremist groups to incite violence. So when that happened, the Secretary General of the United Nations, who was Kofi Annan at the time, he, was, he had just scheduled a week-long uh, series of lectures called Unlearning Intolerance. And um, he was a big fan of cartoons. He, he decided to have a day of cartoons, of people talking about cartoons. And so he invited 12 cartoonists from around the world and I was invited to be a part of this, which was a thrill. To be speaking at the UN about my craft was, was amazing. From that day began an organization called Cartooning for Peace. And it's an organization of about 150 cartoonists around the globe. You know, we do our own work and sometimes we do cartoons for Cartooning for Peace uh, and for their publications. They do a lot of books. We get together with other cartoonists in different parts of the world to talk about our craft to talk about global issues, to talk about how cartoons can be used for dialogue, for understanding, for communication, and, um, and can be used for, for good. So it's a great organization. I love being a part of it. Back uh, five years ago or so, I think it was, uh, I got a gift of an iPad, and uh, I began drawing, fooling around with it, drawing uh, in my living room, um, and I was watching the State of the Union address, which at times can be pretty boring. Um, and I started drawing what I was watching and, uh, and with this app that I use, I could send it out on Twitter immediately, the drawing. And I, I did that and I realized that the response was quite notable, that, that people liked this. The drawings were very quick, very loose, very bold, colorful, just impressions of, or ma making visual fun of somebody's tie or the way, the way a person was standing or something something that, that the president said. And that got me hooked, so I started doing more and more of that from the television, and uh, it became something that I did. I did, did the Oscars from the television, the Grammys. Uh, events that I knew 
a lot of people were watching. It was a way, a way to, again, dialogue with, with my followers on social media. And that has morphed into a whole new segment of my career, which I really enjoy, which is doing this kind of drawing um, at a, actually at events now. And I've been hired by CBS and CNN to, to go to events, to live draw what I'm seeing and, and send it out on social media right away. And also give them their social media team the JPEGs and they can, can send them out. So it's a, it's a way to draw attention to whatever site I'm working for in a visual way. One of the great things about being a cartoonist is that you become aware that everybody loves cartoons. So wherever you go, people, people express joy at the notion that that's what you do. And I think cartoons connect us that way as, as humanity. They remind us of our childhood they, and they remind us maybe of a simpler time and they bring joy. Cartoons bring joy to people. So I feel really lucky to be able to do that.